Perhaps one day, the Northwest Passage will be open to Asia, and our children will be able to work on the cruise ships. There are floods because there's lots of water. The water comes and then it goes away again. Only God knows why. This film shows what life will be like if the ice melts and sea levels rise. Some people think it will help them. Others say we must learn to live with it. Engineers and architects are making plans. Scientists say it could be worse than we think. It will affect us all. The megacities on the coast, towns far inland, and developing countries. When the waters come. a fjord in front of the town of Ilyusat. 40 kilometers long, 7 kilometers wide, 1,200 meters deep. All this is melted glacier ice flowing into the ocean. 20 years ago, this was partly frozen. Now the water is clear. For some local fishermen, this means new opportunities. But their traditional way of life is already disappearing. There's mud along the coasts of Greenland, where before there was snow. Anda has rarely known conditions like this. Rivulets of meltwater bubbling up from nowhere. Places where he has to dismount and help push his sled. Suddenly, the Inuit have to travel a lot further to reach ice fields that are still thick enough to fish from. A bird's eye view makes the situation all too clear. You have to go 70 kilometers inland to find snow and ice that still seem pristine, where the cold appears to be holding. But appearances are deceptive. Here, too, the ice is melting. Fast. There's a group of huts and tents deep in central Greenland. For 17 years, it's been a center of world climatological research. Its name comes from the nationality of the man who founded and runs it. Konrad Stefan has long studied what the rest of us are now waking up to. Our measurements show that the temperature at this location over the last 15 years has increased about 5 degrees centigrade during the winter months. You can't see it, but large amounts of this ice have already melted. Greenland is losing 150 cubic kilometer every year. This is the same amount of ice that the entire volume of all the glaciers in the Alps. We would predict that the sea level rise will be in the order of approximately one meter by 2100. Yeah. It also shows the area here. Greenland's ice has always shrunk in summer and it's usually come back in winter. But now the summer melt is far greater than before and it doesn't all come back. Look at our satellite analysis. This is the record melt from 2005, and all the red area is the extent. The green ice sheet had a melt extent, and the long-term average is actually this yellow line. You can see it actually increased from the yellow line, covered the whole southern part. <laughs> A trip out of the camp used to be a pleasure. But with industrial gases trapping sunlight and warming the atmosphere, it's now becoming dangerous. It's no surprise the ice is melting. 
but it's also moving towards the sea. Meltwater is flooding out underneath the ice, making the ice slip. Stefan's team need to find out exactly where it's happening and how much has thawed. This time of year, in May, the leaks are invisible. From here, Stefan must carry on alone, using radar to check the thickness of the ice, or his skidoo could fall through into a crevasse. In the summer, it looks like this. A moulin. Thousands of tons of meltwater flooding down thousands of meters to the bedrock of Greenland. And then seeping between ice and rock out to sea. Moulin water has a disastrous effect, as climatologist Stefan Ramsdorf explains. This meltwater acts like a lubricant and the ice starts to flow faster and uh, the big outlet glaciers from Greenland are draining down the ice sheet into the ocean at an accelerating rate. And this could actually lead to a much more rapid ice loss than we would have expected from just uh, simple melting at the surface. Checking his radar as he goes, Konrad Stefan turns back to camp. The figures he's gathered here will confirm his worst fears. When we just take the melt of the ice sheet and the melt of the glaciers, the sea level probably will rise by 2,100 by 50 centimeters. Now we have an additional phenomenon, which is the fast flowing ice streams. They were not foreseen, predicted in this half a meter sea level rise. If it continues, the flushing of this fresh water into the ocean, one meter or even maybe one and a half meter, as is predicted by Ramsdorf, would be possible. And the problem, as the scientists know, isn't just in the Arctic and the Antarctic. The ice is melting elsewhere too. For instance, in the glaciers of the Alps. And all this released water has to go somewhere. Glaciers drain into rivers, or they evaporate and they fall as rain. Extreme rainfall events will very likely become more frequent in a warmer world because warm air can simply hold more moisture. For every degree centigrade of warming, you can hold 7% more water in the air, which then rains down. Christopher's family live in Cologne, on the River Rhine in Germany, hundreds of kilometers from the sea. It's been raining here for six days. But this family live on the top floor of their building. They see no reason to panic. Cologne has flooded before. They'll just take the usual precautions. At worst, they'll have to empty the cellar. And at least school's out for Christopher and his sister Clara. But already this year's flooding is worse than it's ever been before. In a situation like this, individuals can take some precautions. They can board up windows to protect them from the pressure of the water. The rescue service is overwhelmed. Only the elderly and vulnerable can be evacuated. No modern city can look after all its citizens. They won't even attempt a general evacuation. And Cologne will have a special problem. The great chemical plants next to the River Rhine, without proper flood defenses, they could become a death trap. Emergency centers will be set up for people who've left their homes but have nowhere to go, as movement becomes impossible. But many determined householders will still refuse to give in to the weather. They've survived these floods before. They know the drill.
until the chemicals seep into the water system. Day eight. Already the water's unsafe to drink. They may have plenty of food supplies and fruit juice. But when the city's infrastructure collapses, they'll be unable to boil water or cook. Today in Greenland, the Inuit have to travel far further than before to find ice they can fish from in the traditional way. All around, the ice scape is dotted with pale pools of meltwater. You can hear how crisp, hard snow is giving way to slush. Hard work for the dogs. Nils Andersen still fishes the traditional way, where he can. He unreels the baited line for hundreds of meters into the glacier water. It'll take four hours to float out on the current. The Inuit have always had plenty of time. Time to watch the glacier water edge slowly, visibly, towards the ocean. Time for Niels to think about the future and whether the melting of the ice could bring any advantages to his people. I don't know if our children will still be fishermen. Who knows, perhaps the Northwest Passage will soon be open from Greenland to Asia, so our children can work on the cruise ships. Some of us believe that will happen. If he's right, there could one day be open sea all around Greenland. After several hours, the catch is reeled in. In recent years, the fish have become smaller. There's less oxygen in the warmer water. That means less plankton and krill for the bigger fish to feed on. They have to catch a lot more fish to make a living. But they don't see any reason to despair. I don't necessarily believe in the scientists and their predictions. Of course, I can see the changes. But many of our elders say that there have always been these changes. In two or three years, it could be colder again. But I find the whole thing very confusing. I don't know what's going to happen. Elsewhere, there's little doubt. Bangladesh, on the Bay of Bengal. It's always been prey to the weather. Cyclones have always ravaged this low-lying country. By the year 2032, it will be under assault from three directions. Melting Himalayan glaciers, rising sea levels, and the annual monsoon rains. For 12-year-old Fatima and her mother, this could be the end of their way of life. But today, there's little understanding of the coming disaster. It's always been like this. There are floods because there's lots of water. The water comes and then it goes again. Only God knows why. The monsoon makes their fields fruitful. But by 2032, because of climate change, the rains could destroy their livelihood. There will be flood emergency centers. 
They'll do what they can, issuing warnings, helping a tiny minority. But their task will be impossible. For Fatima and her mother, there will be only one choice. To leave. as their village disintegrates around them. They can save their livestock and a few possessions. But they have nowhere to go. Perhaps they can join her father in the city. But there will be no work for them there and nowhere to live. And this time there will be no coming back. In Bangladesh alone, tens of millions of people could be uprooted. All over the world, 500 million could become climate refugees. It would be the biggest human migration in history. signs are already here today. By 2032, the waters will have risen for good. Countless more will share the experience of this man. Water is good when I can drink it, but this water is bad. It destroys our lives and it's coming more and more often. The floods have destroyed everything, my family, our house, our dreams. Look around. Water everywhere. I've lost everything. They will go to the cities, and there will be no room for them there. They will expect help from elsewhere. They'll see it as their right. People in developing countries are becoming aware that uh, a lot of uh, that is not natural disasters but has something to do with climate change and they see the main culprits in the wealthy northern countries and uh, they certainly have got a point because the industrialized nations are responsible for three quarters of the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere now. Where will they go? The developed countries have a long tradition of taking in refugees. But by 2032, they'll have problems of their own. New York. A late spring day in Central Park. Mommy, look at my kite, look, look! I know, I see it, it's lovely. Nothing surprises New Yorkers. But today, they're about to see a phenomenon even they aren't used to. Suddenly, the sky darkens. Squalls have started to hit the Big Apple. They seem to come out of nowhere. 
This is an effect of global warming. And these squalls are a precursor of far fiercer winds. Hurricanes could uh, reach New York more frequently because the North Atlantic is getting warmer and warmer and that means that the area that would really support strong hurricanes is moving further north. So the risk of New York being struck by a hurricane on top of already higher sea level will also go up. <laughs> The squalls will disappear as fast as they came, shortly before the real hurricane strikes. In the deceptive calm, Louisa and her mother face another danger. No, Louisa, don't touch it. Look, Mom, look at all these dead birds. Warmer weather will bring tropical diseases to today's temperate climates. Ah! Mum, I got bitten! Louisa, we shouldn't stay here. Let's go home. And then the hurricane will hit. A low-lying city, ill-equipped to cope. Hurricane Mary has hit New York City. The storm surge has flooded JFK International Airport. All flights have been canceled, and thousands of passengers are stranded at the airport. Even more threatening, according to the mayor's spokesperson, is a wave of disease that could turn into a pandemic. Earlier today, hundreds of dead birds were found in Central Park. They have tested positive for West Nile virus. The disease first appeared in New York City over 30 years ago probably brought from Asia or the Middle East. Since then, people. more than 165,000 people have been infected in the United States and over 22,000 deaths have been reported. The mayor's office has advised people showing the first signs of fever, body aches, or red skin rash to go directly to their nearest hospital. In Cologne, the chemical overspill has polluted the Rhine. Anyone who drank tap water is now at risk. It's impossible to get medical help to isolated families. They must struggle on their own. The emergency centers are overwhelmed. People are close to panic. Everybody wants fresh water. The elderly and the young are most vulnerable. Not just from the polluted water. Dehydration will kill faster than the chemical poisons. She desperately needs a supply of fresh water. Greenland's ice contains enough water to raise sea levels by seven meters worldwide. Konrad Stefan and his team are setting up a new satellite station. It will measure how quickly the ice is moving towards the sea. His team discovers that it's traveling twice as fast as before. This new station we put in over here is really going to be interesting because we believe this ice flows down through Jakobshavn Glacier. It was flowing about six kilometers a year, and now it's 12 kilometers. If these glaciers are moving at a similar speed, not as fast as Jakobshavn, but do they really push out enough ice that could actually increase the ice loss here in the Arctic? In the the answer is yes. I would not predict that the entire Greenland ice sheet, the seven meter of fresh water stored here in Greenland, would actually flush into the ocean by 2100. 
However, I would think that the major part of the increase of the sea level, which is predicted up to one meter, would be from the Greenland ice sheet. After days of wind and rain, Manhattan is awash and the water's still rising. By 2032, the health services of a modern city can screen for an infectious disease at high speed. This will be essential to prevent panic in a nervous population. Okay. Okay. All right, I can see your dad here. Okay. Yes, sir. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Proceed to the vaccination, okay. please, sir. Uh, please, please come here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. A simple vaccination will provide protection if you haven't been infected. But treating the disease itself may not be so straightforward. Outside, the hurricane is in full spate. The winds create havoc. High water and a storm surge have flooded Manhattan. Anyone caught on a security camera will be extraordinarily lucky. Modern cities would be too dense, their infrastructure too complex, for the emergency services to protect the citizens. They will be overwhelmed from the first hours of the disaster. Rescue like this will not be possible for many. By now, in flooded Cologne, people are forced to fend for themselves. They have to be inventive. Ich 
But fresh water can come too late. Papa! Medical help is essential. She has to get to a hospital. By now, the city has ceased to function. People can't help each other, or they won't. The common interest is disintegrating. The authorities have started to clear the emergency centers where they can. Those who can be moved are taken to shelters outside the city or on higher ground. The city is being abandoned. Only one country has put into action a national plan to protect itself from the floods. The Netherlands, on Europe's Atlantic coast. The Dutch have spent billions on dams, dikes, sluice gates and locks to keep the sea out of their country. More than a quarter of it is below sea level. They had an early warning. In 1953, a combination of high spring tides and a storm surge inundated great parts of the country, killing nearly 2,000 people. The Dutch decided it must never happen again. A great national project was developed, the Delta Plan. Whatever it cost, the sea must be kept out. For 50 years, this policy has been supremely successful. But sea level rise and the prospect of the River Rhine flooding have caused a radical rethink. Architect Cohen Oltus is working on a new approach to the problem, one designed for the challenges of the 21st century. The idea is to live with the sea, not fight against it. At this research center, they're testing the latest design of artificial islands. The waves slap against them, but they're built in shapes and with materials that won't be torn apart by the rising waters. And there's more. If you look into the future, you will see that the, the, the border between water and land will be more diffuse. Before it was very strict. You build on the land and you swim in the water, and that's the end. And now what we do, we see that, that, that cities will go over the water, and even building completely cities on the water. So um, that will be the major change. What the Dutch architects are conceiving in Northwest Europe they're trying out 2,000 kilometers away in the Persian Gulf, in Dubai. This tiny Gulf state may have become a home for fantasy architecture, but it's based on very solid foundations. These vast constructions, islands four meters higher than sea level, are designed to withstand both sea level rise and storm surges they probably won't encounter here. 
Their rock outlines are filled with sand dredged from the seabed. These desert islands will soon be home to millionaires. Where other countries are in danger of losing their coastlines, Dubai is building into the sea. And the ambitions of the architects know no bounds. Not just artificial islands, but entire floating resorts. If this floating harbour seems far-fetched, the principle is anything but. At least according to Koen Oldhus in the Netherlands, he's just starting on a smaller scale. Back in Holland, he's designed a simple home that's neither a houseboat nor a stilt house, but a combination of the two. He believes this could be part of the solution to the problem of the rising waters. It has the advantages of a fixed house and of a mobile boat. Because it isn't static, it moves up and down. Of course you can ha uh, build houses on piles, but that's a static level. And if you know that the sea can rise for three meters, then all the houses have to build three meters above the water. And people like to have contact with the water. And building floating houses, they are directly on the water. And if the water comes up, the house will go with the water. Altus believes whole towns can be built like this. Towns that will adapt when the floods come again and again. In North Germany, there are people who've already learned to adapt. On the Halligan, a set of coastal islands cut off from the mainland at high tide. 400 people live here. Sea level rise is making things harder for them. But farmer Frank Johansen is philosophical. There's no point in trying to fight against nature. You have to see how you can live reasonably well with it. Resistance is futile. <laughs> the people here have built defenses, but they know they're temporary. When the high waters come, they take the necessary action. Yeah. The big tides, the heavy tides, are coming more and more frequently. And the water levels are rising permanently. It's getting higher. They won't raise the flood defenses on the Halligan any higher. There's no point. Yet people will always want to live here. until they disappear. This is Peru, close to the equator, the highest glacier on Earth. Lonnie Thompson is a legendary paleoclimatologist. He researches the climate, not today's, 
but hundreds and thousands of years ago. He's over 60, and he shouldn't be working here. Living at these altitudes could kill him. But there are things he has to find out. Because here, too, the glaciers are melting. You think about, well, what if we lost 8% of the ice on our planet due to warming? What would happen to sea level? Well, you'd be looking at sea levels that are five to seven meters higher than today, with this, which is not an alarmist view. Uh, 8% is a very small amount of, uh, of the total ice that's out there. If Lonnie Thompson is prepared to struggle through some of the highest, harshest landscapes on Earth, it's not just because these melting glaciers are contributing to global warming. They also contain the history of the world's climate. And that precious data is disappearing with the ice. Thompson comes here every year to capture the information and register the changes. Now, at the summit of the Quelkaya Glacier, his team are drilling ice cores containing precise records of the temperature levels of the past. It's one of the surest ways to measure what's really happening to our climate. Every year, the changing seasons leave their mark in the fresh snow. Variations in oxygen isotopes at each level of this frozen column will allow exact comparisons to be made. In today's world, we're very interested in how has the climate changed in the 20th century. And these samples allow us to compare uh, the 20th century with 1,700 years uh, back in time. So we can determine how different things are. The 10 by 10. That's sample 31. Once the ice has been sliced up and labeled, it can be thawed and sent off for analysis. Lonnie Thompson isn't expecting good news. No, it keeps going up. Sample 10, 10 centimeters? Yep. If we look at our best models, our projections for the next 100 years, temperatures rising to 3 degrees C above, uh, above the day's temperatures, and you look at the geologic record and you say, OK, how far back do you have to go to where you have 3 degrees C warmer temperatures? And that's actually back in the Pliocene, almost 3 million years ago. And then you say, well, what was sea level 3 million years ago? And it was 25 meters, plus or minus 10 meters higher than today. In Cologne, Christopher and his sister are lucky. The hospital has just managed to keep functioning. Its water supply has not been contaminated. Clara can now be helped by straightforward rehydration to replace the fluids her body has lost. Clara, 
Clara? Clara? This simple treatment has saved her life. In New York, Louisa, too, is safe. There's led to massive flooding on four continents. The scale of this disaster has turned out to be worse than all the recent scientific predictions. Hurricane Mary is still battering the eastern seaboard of the U.S. Billions of dollars of damage have been caused in coastal cities. South Asia has been hit by repeated storm surges. Following the cyclone in Bangladesh, a state of emergency has been declared. Hundreds of thousands of survivors are desperately trying to leave their devastated country. In Germany, along the Rhine, the situation remains severe. The city center of Cologne is several feet underwater. There is a shortage of drinking water in the emergency camps where thousands of people have taken refuge. This is only a possible future scenario. But it is a realistic one. And already, pressure groups in the developed countries are warning of the radical steps they believe need to be taken. If climate change goes as far as we believe it will, then a city like Cologne will regularly suffer what we now call the flood of the century. Then parts of Cologne, the old city and some of the suburbs will have to be given up. Anyone with any common sense must recognize that these districts are no longer tenable, and as harsh and unbelievable as it may sound, they will have to be abandoned. In Cologne and in many other places, it would mean the end of hundreds or even thousands of years of continuous habitation. Scientists believe it can still be avoided. Their answer is stark but clear. We would have to reduce our emissions worldwide by half by the year 2050 and even further after that. I think that uh, this is achievable and it even makes economic sense because the economists now tell us, uh, like the uh, famous Stern report, that it is actually much cheaper to do that rather than to do nothing and then pay for all the consequences of climate change. The worst case is that we just don't get our act together and that we just keep going and that greenhouse gases keep rising. We may well end up at five or six or maybe even seven degrees global warming. That is a world that I don't really want to imagine and I certainly wouldn't want to uh, live in it or wish this on anybody, let alone my own uh, daughter or, my, or grandchildren. all too clear. You have to go 70 kilometers inland to find snow and ice that still seem pristine, where the cold appears to be holding. But appearances are deceptive. Here too, the ice is melting. Fast. There's a group of huts and tents deep in central Greenland. For 17 years, it's been a center of world climatological research. Its name comes from the nationality of the man who founded and runs it. Konrad Stefan has long studied what the rest of us are now waking up to. Our measurements show that the temperature at this location over the last 15 years has increased about 5 degrees centigrade during the winter months. You can't see it, but large amounts of this ice have already melted. 
Greenland is losing 150 cubic kilometer every year. This is the same amount of ice that the entire volume of all the glaciers in the Alps. We would predict that the sea level rise will be in the order of approximately one meter by 2100. Yeah. It also shows the area here. Greenland's ice has always shrunk in summer and it's usually come back in winter. But now the summer melt is far greater than before and it doesn't all come back. Look at our satellite analysis. This is the record melt from 2005 and all the red area is the extent. The Greenland ice sheet had a melt extent and the long term average is actually this yellow line. You can see it actually increased from the yellow line, covered the whole southern part. A trip out of the camp used to be a pleasure. But with industrial gases trapping sunlight and warming the atmosphere, it's now becoming dangerous. It's no surprise the ice is melting, but it's also moving towards the sea. Perhaps one day, the Northwest Passage will be open to Asia, and our children will be able to work on the cruise ships. There are floods because there's lots of water. The water comes and then it goes away again. Only God knows why. This film shows what life will be like if the ice melts and sea levels rise. Some people think it will help them, Others say we must learn to live with it. Engineers and architects are making plans. Scientists say it could be worse than we think. It will affect us all. The megacities on the coast, towns far inland, and developing countries. When the waters come. Greenland, a fjord in front of the town of Iljusa. Meltwater is flooding out underneath the ice, making the ice slip. Stefan's team need to find out exactly where it's happening and how much has thawed. This time of year, in May, the leaks are invisible. From here, Stefan must carry on alone, using radar to check the thickness of the ice or his skidoo could fall through into a crevasse. In the summer, it looks like this. A moulin. Thousands of tons of meltwater flooding down thousands of meters to the bedrock of Greenland. And then seeping between ice and rock out to sea. Moulin water has a disastrous effect, as climatologist Stefan Ramsdorf explains. This meltwater acts like a lubricant and the ice starts to flow faster and uh, the big outlet glaciers from Greenland are draining down the ice sheet into the ocean. 40 kilometers long, 7 kilometers wide, 1,200 meters deep. All this is melted glacier ice flowing into the ocean. 20 years ago, this was partly frozen. Now the water is clear. For some local fishermen, this means new opportunities. But their traditional way of life is already disappearing. There's mud along the coasts of Greenland, where before there was snow. Anda has rarely known conditions like this. Rivulets of meltwater bubbling up from nowhere. Places where he has to dismount and help push his sled. Suddenly the Inuit have to travel a lot further to reach ice fields that are still thick enough to fish from. A 
bird's eye view makes the situation